Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. James Bloom. James, or Jim Blum, is the Chief Medical Information Officer for the University of Iowa and an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology with certifications in critical care and clinical informatics. He's an NIH, uh, BARDA, and VA-funded investigator focusing on using large data sets to predict critical illness after surgery. In his current capacities at the University of Iowa, he is looking for ways to utilize information technology to not only improve direct clinical care, but utilize the data created from the electronic medical record and other systems to further the organization's tripartite academic mission. Jim, Dr. Bloom, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure for us to have you on. You've led a truly fascinating career uh, centered around technology for the most part, medicine and patient care, of course. Uh, unlike most physicians who start in life sciences or health sciences, you actually had a degree in computer science first. And so the question to start off the podcast, why computer science initially and what was the turning point for you to, to go into medicine? Yeah, so that's a, that's a bit of a of a long story. So uh, I was growing up and uh, really had a love of computing from very early on in my career uh, or in my life. Uh, my my parents bought an Apple IIe when I was, you know, I think probably about five or six years old, and really started to to work on on programming and and computing in general. And then I found myself in uh, high school than being uh, at a, an interesting high school that was, that was focused on new forms of education and had some grant funding in that, was one of the first high schools ever connected to the internet, actually. This was in like 1990, like 1990. Um, and, and I was very fortunate to be sort of very on the tech side of it. They really let me you know, really assist with the implementation and the connectivity and all that. And I was, went through my college career thinking uh, I was going to go into computing. My goal was actually, you know, to get a job in Silicon Valley, worshiped at the temple of like Bill Joy and, you know, the folks at Sun Microsystems at the time. And in, in college, my grandfather passed away sort of unexpectedly from uh, metastatic bladder cancer, that it's not clear that the PATH report was actually his path report that he got results on and and made a decision for a incomplete resection of his tumor versus having a cystectomy. And so it really, I think, was a medical information error that led to his led to his death. Uh, and so at that point, I was a junior in college, and I was you know starting to think about going into uh, you know looking for my my first uh, first job that would you know potentially be in California or something like that. And then going off and getting an MBA and being rich, that was the plan. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I sort of converted um, to saying, okay, I want to apply this information technology stuff and computing to, to the betterment of, of healthcare and, and, and mankind. It was a very different time, right? You know, EMRs were not really prevalent. Uh, you know, they were mostly billing systems, uh, all the things that a totally different world than we live in today. And so that was the, that was the pivot. Did you take time to make that decision? Like, did you spend a year working in, in Silicon Valley or, or not? Uh, so, so uh, that was my junior year of college um, that, that, that occurred. And so I spent about, so I was actually scheduled that following semester to go overseas. So I spent a, a semester overseas. I really contemplated what I wanted to do. And then I came back and decided, okay, I'm going to do this. So I actually uh, ended up spending an extra year doing all the prereqs okay. and then uh, applying to, uh, I took a job at, at uh, Duke as a research assistant um, working in clinical informatics there with a, with a gentleman named Ed Hammond and uh, Joseph Hales, who are you know fairly well, well known in uh, folks in uh, clinical informatics, uh, why I applied. And so I, I had a good idea of what I was getting into. And as a high school student and as a college student, I worked at a company called uh, Merit Network, which was contracted, that was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they were uh, contracted to do a lot of, uh, you know, sort of 
at that time kind of NSF funded work for for the internet at the time um, as it was pivoting into the commercial entity that it is today. They actually provided the internet connectivity to the to that high school I discussed with you. So, so let me get this straight. So you spent like three years focusing on computer science and tech, and then, and then in one year you're like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do biology. I'm gonna do all these prereqs that I never did for three years, and then I'm gonna get into medical school. That, that's pretty phenomenal, I have to say. Yeah, it was it was a bit of it. I mean, my father's a physician, and so mm -hmm. I I had some ideas to what I was getting into. He said, "You really want to do this?" And I said, "Yeah." And he's like you really want to do this? So, uh, <laughs> so he was supportive and he's a very proud father, but, uh, but it definitely was a, was a, was a change. I got to ask Jim, how, how do you think, you know, coming from the clinical world and then kind of bridging these two loves of yours together, how does that impact the system at scale when you're looking at technology coming from the clinical world? Yeah, I think you have an appreciation for the different perspectives that everyone's coming to the table with. You know, you have clinicians that are coming to the table with a very evidence-based focus, a, a real focus on, and also to some extent, a very selfish focus, right? I mean, you know, the demands on clinicians today are very different than they were even when I began my career, you know, 15 years ago when I became an attending. You know, the financial pressures are much higher. The productivity pressures are much higher. The patient care expectations are much higher. Um, you know, patient experience, you know, if you're going to ask 15 years ago about patient experience, people would be like, what's that? Uh, not, not quite, but you know, it's a much bigger thing than what we do today. And lifestyle changes have really, have really changed with physicians as well and what they want out of their practice and their expectations. So I think I have that appreciation. Now on the tech side, you understand the complexities of implementing tech uh, and the programming issues and the systems integration issues. And that, yes, you know, system X won't talk to system Y. Yes, that's a problem, right? And we might be able to fix that internally, right? But that's a lot of development. Is that something we want to invest in? Or do we want to put those resources elsewhere? And should we wait? And, you know, clinicians, I think, don't have an appreciation for the level of complexity uh, that it takes to sometimes code these things up and develop them, mm -hmm. you know, even though they use products that are produced by you know billion-dollar mm -hmm. companies and all, you know with with tens or hundreds of thousands of employees, uh, there's the thought that like this team of like four people in the back room somewhere in their spare time can make you know can make magic happen. <laughs> so um, so it, I think it gives you a, a perspective on both sides. So yeah, and Jim, before we get too deep onto the clinical informatics and the health tech side, I did want to circle back a bit and learn a bit more about why you ended up in anesthesiology and critical care. Yeah, so great question. So I was a medical student in Baltimore. And at that time, I was very fortunate. I was, I was at uh, Johns Hopkins. And yeah, we were right up the road from right up the road from NIH. And so we actually had, while I was a medical student, both Francis Collins and Craig Vetner in person for us to, you know, kind of, kind of see. And when you talk about big data in healthcare, there's nothing like genomic data, right? And you're talking, you know, terabyte per sequence, you know, per human sequence. And so, or, or more. And so at the time I was looking at big data and thinking about, you know, before it was called big data, right? And how do we use data from the EMR to impact medical research. And in the future, we, I was thinking, you know, we'll have all this data, things that, things that we now have, I was thinking, you know, every, I think everyone saw that this was eventually going to happen. So I'm sitting there thinking, wow, genomics would be great, but you know, it takes like, it's taken like whatever, 10 years to sequence one person. This is, you know, whole genome sequencing is never going to happen, right? You know, uh, little did I know. So I think if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have looked in, into oncology or something well, like yeah. that. But at the time, there was a lot of data in critical care, right? You were capturing off monitors, you know, high velocity waveform data conceivably. There was work being done with with Mimic and other, other sources of data uh, like that at the time. And I said, okay, this seems like an area that that you can impact things. And also it was just a, a great high paced, you know, field, lots of stuff going on and very instant gratification. 
a lot of instant gratification and caring for those patients in, in the OR and in the ICU. And so that's really, well, really why I focused in, in those areas. It seemed to bring all those things together. So. And, and when you first started practicing as an attending, were you getting into the informatics and tech stuff pretty quickly, or, or did you actually spend some time just focused on clinical stuff before you got dragged back into the informatics world? So through my, through my residency, and even my residency, I was very focused on a research uh, career at the time and focused very much on you, how do we use the data to help, uh, to help do that research. So I was involved in research very much from as a resident and uh, early in my attending career. It wasn't as much on the functional side, but I always wanted to be on that kind of clinical translational side of things, which unfortunately is a very difficult area. I think it's easier now than it was, but was a very difficult area to get funded in from the NIH or other federal agencies, because I think that a lot of things that we wanted to focus on were seen as, well, health systems should be just doing that, mm -hmm. right? This is going to improve the care of their patients. This seems to make sense, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. Why would you study that, right? Mm -hmm. Just do it. As opposed to, you know, ontology development or, um, you know, other things or, or large data set aggregation, things like that, that were, I think, more well appreciated at the time. I think it's changed from where it was. But so I was very engaged in the research side of informatics. Operationally, that seemed to move uh, more so over the past few years, my engagement. And I think really for the work that I want to do, the operation side is a great place to be just so long as we keep the research mission in mind and we study what we do from an operational perspective. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so Jim, you actually mentioned already the complexities that is involved with developing a new workflow or a new uh, technology and maybe physicians don't always realize the extent of those complexities. I read a, a recent Becker's article on the impact of telehealth on rural communities. And in that article, you were sharing how your main priorities really are quite large, quite broad in scope. There's the, you know, on one hand, the uh, outcome of improving patient outcomes uh, with new technologies. And then you also have to balance that with enhancing the provider workflow and their experience as well. And it's kind of like both sides of this equation, you have to balance them both. So given such a broad scope, how do you prioritize what to work on first and what has the biggest impact? Well, how do you go about prioritizing that? Yeah, so uh, my focus is first and foremost on patient outcomes, right? What can we do to improve their outcomes? Uh, you, healthcare, we are very fortunate to do what we do in taking care of people, right? Uh, it's a burden and we talk about clinician burnout and all that, and I think it's real. I don't want to poo-poo it, but but our first obligation is to to taking great care of people. And so that is always what I'm going to look for as the first thing. How do we improve the care we deliver? No or no healthcare organization is perfect. How do we how do we continue to move that needle? Uh, and and so we get better outcomes. I don't think it's mutually exclusive though, right? I think if you find ways to improve provider happiness, you provide better technology for providers. Frequently, that can help improve the outcomes of patients. Regarding the rural aspects, I think there are some real fundamental challenges to caring for people in the rural environment. What are the resources that are available in a 25-bed cr critical access hospital that may be the only healthcare facility for 100 miles for somebody? How do you get them specialty care? How do you make sure that the providers that are at those locations are supported. It's one of the things I love working about at the University of Iowa is we actually talk about these problems. We are focused on these problems. We see them as things that, that we need to do to help uh, the providers across the state. And so uh, I think that, that it's a real difficult balance to figure out where you're going to invest, uh, where you're going to make that first step um, and you need to be willing to risk things and, and potentially have them not pan out. 
but you need to, I, I think you need to look at this a little bit as a venture capital opportunity, except, uh, you know, your return on investment may not necessarily be financial. It'll be in, in better health for people, which ultimately pays off for us as a society and hopefully helps that works out for the health system. Hey, Jim, you, you know, right now, like you, you kind of mentioned the challenge around staff burnout and um, with the, and the healthcare workforce is probably under, you know, more strain. Um, the last few years than we've seen maybe in decades. And, you know, um, there's there's a hospital CEO, CEO that I know who has a, I'll call it maybe a, a contrarian view where, where instead of putting patients always first, you know, one of his phrases is, well, if, if, staff, if staff satisfaction is high, that leads to higher patient satisfaction outcomes because then if they can take care of themselves, then they can take care of patients. And, you know, as a CMIO, I'm guessing a lot of the work that you do um, is an improving and streamlining clinician workflow, which frees up time maybe for more patient care or or less burnout. So I'm I'm curious if you have a, a take on on that phrase. Yeah, I think there's there's truth to that, right? Um, if people don't feel like they're taken care of, it gets very difficult for them to take care of other people. And so I I like I said, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Um, with that said. We are a very large academic institution and we have very different kind of workflows and patterns um, to what you see at, you know, a community hospital, right? I mean, for every patient that gets seen, you know, we, we have a trainee or an advanced practitioner, I think, engaged in almost every patient that's seen, uh, that's being seen at the University of Iowa. So the, the clinical and administrative workflow is more distributed, right? And that makes it very different from someone who is seeing patients independently in their clinic and has a panel of 20 patients in the morning and 20 patients in the, in the afternoon that they need to see in an ambulatory clinic, as opposed to our work, in, our work environments. Now we, we have that, right? But it's not, that's not the majority of our, of our faculty. And so uh, definitely looking at provider happiness is something that's important to me. Um, we're going to start participating in the Arch Collaborative this year uh, uh, to assess, you know, where are we at? We pay attention to our Epic Signal data uh, you know, with a real focus on pajama time. And uh, so, so we are really focusing on provider wellness, but in terms of where we're going to make, where, where are we going to make our biggest investments this year? it's going to be on things that are going to impact uh, patient care, right? You know, that's, that's where we're going to, that's where we're going to double down. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll also make providers happier and, and that'll impact the outcome as well. Makes sense. And kind of Jim, along with that thinking uh, you've mentioned it already, but access is one of the most crucial challenges for all health systems and especially over in, in Iowa. Uh, I'm curious knowing that access is this emerging problem. It's, it's always been here, but it's becoming more and more evident as we scale out some of these remote technologies and things. Maybe technology isn't always the best solution to solving some of these access issues. I'm wondering, could you share like one or two learnings that you've had on this front to ensuring that access is always top of mind for the institution? Yeah, I, I think particularly for us, access is is something we talk about daily. Um, I used to, uh, I still have an appointment at the VA and access to the VA was always talked about as well. And so this is not an uncommon discussion for me. I think that the first thing in terms of access is tech can help you with access, but the most important thing with access is triage, right? Figuring out what can wait and what can't. And there may be a tech side to facilitating workflows there and some things like that, but ultimately you need really good humans in the mix with really good workflow, really good uh, referral uh, ability to, to ingest the data that they need and have a clinician really triage those, uh, triage those cases. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, and then I think having an intelligent discussion about where the human capital is going to be, you know, it may be that you are better off 
not implementing a telehealth solution and packing people up and sending them someplace mm -hmm. uh, and having people seen in person in a remote clinic versus opening telehealth. On the flip side, there may be times where telehealth is a far more intelligent solution, right? Um, and we're, we're looking at doing that with our transplant program right now. Uh, when you look at getting evaluated for a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, we service the folks, the people of the state of Iowa, and conceivably someone could have a five hour drive to come and see us only to be told you're not a candidate, right? So we want to try to avoid that. And so our goals going forward are to, to be able to provide an, a first pass screening for folks for transplant uh, completely virtually, um, including the education and everything. So this would be after, you know, someone said, yes, this seems like a reasonable person to, to have a discussion with. So I think that there's, it's balance. There's balance as there's everything in life and finding where the fulcrum needs to needs to be is is something that takes time and experience and and you need to be willing to learn from your mistakes you know and that's i think where access really comes how, how you address access problems you can't address them overnight unfortunately and clearly the answer of just hire more people is always a great answer <laughs> um but um you know, so is also like, you know, raising my salary or, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, giving me gold from Fort Knox. Those are great answers too. Right. You know, so, uh, you got to work within the constraints that you have. So. It, and Jim, you know, in health systems, like I've sometimes noticed that there's misalignment between, um, how it and, and clinicians evaluate digital health solutions. So, you know, it often focuses on let's compare features and then clinicians are like, well, let's look at the clinical validation and the evidence. And not only as a CMIO, but the fact that you've, you know, come from both tech and healthcare in your, your training, I feel like you, you're in a unique position to take both into account. Um, you know, I saw you at the Becker's digital health conference earlier this year on a panel, and you mentioned how, you know, you're pitched by digital health vendors all the time, but then you're often disappointed by, by the lack of evidence. And I'm curious for clinicians who are trying to help, you know, IT and digital folks understand how to assess, you know, tech and digital health solutions through a more clinical lens. Um, how have you helped, you know, bridge that understanding? Like, how do you advise clinicians to, to communicate around this with, with IT? Yeah. So from a clinician perspective, I will say that I am profoundly disappointed in any evidence for practically any healthcare IT solution that comes forward. We in the, the healthcare IT approach to developing evidence is, you know, let's do a case study at some institution, and particularly from the vendor perspective, right? You know, we do not treat these things like we treat pharmaceuticals, right? And yet many of these solutions are implemented with profound claims that are, that it's going to improve revenue. It's going to improve outcomes. It's going to do all of this stuff. And yet there's like no evidence that it does so. So I think from a clinician perspective, it gets really hard, really, really hard to, um, to buy what you're being sold. And you almost need to move into the, into the tech mindset of, okay, this seems to make sense. I believe what the vendor is selling. Uh, let's go ahead and do that, right? You know, on the tech side, I think we really do focus on uh, specifications, all those types of things. And I think that we get too focused on that, on the tech side of things, right? Uh, we are currently rolling out our motion monitoring program. And I'll be honest with you, you know, yeah, there's benefit, there's pros and cons to all the vendors. But at the end of the day, I look at this much more as a commodity item that I just want to work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but whether I'm buying a Honda Accord or a Toyota Corolla or a Toyota Camry or, a, you know, a Chevy Silverado or an F-150, you know, it, it's still going to get me to work and back. That's all I want is something to get me to work and back. And yeah, there may be pros and cons, these types of things. And so I think on the tech side, you can get really bogged down on the nuance when at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, right? You know, just so long as it works and it, and, it, and, it, and it does what it said it was. So choosing the best product, I think can really lead to, and with our acquisition processes that 
that exist in every organization, it can really negatively impact your agility and it negatively impacts outcomes for patients, right? When it takes you, you know, as long as it takes to acquire products and implement them. And I think we frequently spend a lot of time looking at the bells and whistles of products, uh, particularly on the tech side, rather than looking at things like what's the integration time, mm -hmm. right? You know, one of our, one of my philosophies is we should always, we should always where possible buy an Epic product first, right? Because the integration is easier. It's a single interface, all these things. And the time it takes to get the product stand, stood up and implemented is going to be, you know, half to a third, what it would be to bring in a third party vendor. Right. Um, and that's after you say, let's actually acquire the product. Right. You know, it's, it's just all the integrations, all the training, all that takes so much time. And I'm not certain that we necessarily uh, do a great job on either clinician or on the tech side of appreciating that. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of focus on let's buy the best product. Um, although I think that's that a lot of places are coming around to, to a different, different mindset on that. Yeah. I think going off of a, a real patient centered approach would not always be let's get the best thing, but let's get the thing that works faster and provides the better outcome. So that makes a lot of sense. I also really appreciate you've had, uh, you've shared in the past some perspectives around predictive modeling being one of the greatest opportunities that is here today and for tomorrow. In particular, I really liked your insights on how can we leverage the technology to forecast risk uh, and also to implement better protocols with branches that personalize medicine. I'm really curious in an industry where lower variation of care is often the goal, how do you view the role that technology can play in actually personalizing medicine and care? Yeah, so I think I think that's a really interesting discussion. So when you look at predictive modeling, I, I don't look at predictive modeling as personalization of care. It is it is population health, right? Mm -hmm. You know that is what you are doing with any predictive model you are taking a population and you are applying it to that individual patient. You're seeing, you know, where does that patient, where does that patient exist inside uh, that model's uh, output? So with that said, I think there's real opportunities to then personalize, right? After you screen that patient, after you've applied the model, you know, does what the model say make sense? Uh, for that patient. And, and we're not to the point, I think, right now that that in almost anything, uh, particularly in the acute care environment, that you can say, okay, we're going to rely on the predictive model without having a provider engaged. And that's where the personalization comes in. It's where the provider gets engaged. I think the big problem we have right now is people don't understand these predictive models. Uh, the Average provider, when you look at what they're used to ordering, they're used to ordering typically definitive tests or potentially screening tests, right? Uh, but with a screening test, then you usually say, okay, now I need to order. Very straightforward. I order the screening test, then I order the next test, which is the definitive test, right? Um, so people aren't used to thinking about predictive models and, and ordering things that have positive predictive values that are, you know, 0.2 to 0.5, um, knowing that half of the time that what they, the result they get back is not going to be the right result. And oh, by the way, there's no formulaic next step, what to do when that test comes back. So I think predictive modeling really involves people being educated to understand how that model has been tuned and implemented at that organization. And it's very different from traditional testing, right, uh, in, in medicine. And uh, people need to understand uh, receiver operating curves. They need to understand how those things are generated. They need to understand precision recall. And they need to understand the choices that were made so that when they get you know, when that sepsis alert pops up, they know, okay, this patient is, you know, has likely a sepsis one in five times, right? So you know, what am I going to do to work them up at that point? Okay. 
it's a very difficult problem that we're facing with the integration of predictive modeling into, into clinical care. And I think that's why you're seeing so many bad results from studies that have implemented predictive modeling in a randomized control fashion, because you're just seeing uh, alerts that are going off with people that don't have a good effector arm that are well-educated as to what to do with those alerts. Um, there's also a, an unrealistic expectation that they're going to be ultra-sensitive and ultra-specific. Uh, you, you, people need to understand that these are the way that these models are tuned is there's going to be a whole bunch of cases that you miss, you know, and, oh, by the way, the ones that you get alerted to, you know, there's going to be a hit rate of one in whatever. And so how you educate people and how you execute on that, I don't think we figured out completely in medicine yet. I, I think uh, you bring up some really good points there, Jim. And I think one of the things that strikes me is, um, you know, in medicine, I think we're often taught to ask the question, well, if I learn this insight or this piece of information, does it change my management? And if it doesn't, why am I looking into it? And I can foresee a lot of situations where if you had a lot of predictive modeling analytics in play, you can raise all these insights. But to your point, if clinicians aren't you know, trained or, or there's no expectations on acting on that insider data, it becomes confusing as to, to why we're doing the first place. So for example, I'll, I'll take like a anesthesiology perioperative um, situation. I mean, imagine if you know, we had some very strong predicted modeling for, um, you know, post-operative complications and, and, and how we could optimize a patient. But for example, if the clinical team doesn't want to act on the information, if we, you know, don't want to optimize these things preoperatively, then what was the point of flagging that, I guess? And so I'm curious, like, how do you think we can bridge that? Like, is, is it okay to say, hey, you know what, for now, we are just going to focus on the modeling. And then at some point, we will figure out the path to making it actionable? Or do you feel like we have to plan around the actions first so that we can get people on board with accepting the modeling? I'm like, you know, can we, like, what's the right path forward with? Yeah, chicken, or, it's a it's a classic yeah. chicken, mm -hmm. chicken or egg problem. I, yeah, you know, I think generating the models is a great academic exercise, right? There's all types of models that are out there floating around, you know, in the public domain practically and you know people think they can commercialize these things i'm not i'm not exactly sure how successful folks will be unless you're really implementing a whole bunch of other stuff associated with with those models um so i think when you are looking at integrate developing and implementing one of these models you need to have the e the effector arm before you're looking figured out before you implement these things we have intentionally chosen not we have a bunch of models running in the background that we validated at the University of Iowa that we have not implemented because we don't have an effective effector arm. And uh, being an intensivist uh, and, and being pretty familiar with the uh, with the sepsis literature, I think what you see is profound failures in a lot of these things because uh, you know alerts go off, patients you know, you know that the, the positive predictive values of these things is going to be you know let's just take one and three as an example. Mm -hmm. A provider is going to get that alert. If you just send it to providers in general, they're going to get that alert maybe two times a quarter, mm. right? So they'll see that the two times they got it, the patient wasn't septic. They go and they see the patient. They look at them. They're like, "This guy looks better than I do," right? Yes. You, know, I, you know, so uh, you know, what's what's the sepsis alert going off for, right? You know, woke me up for this, right? So. I, I think you need people to be exposed to these things. They need to see a lot of the alerts. They need to see the value of them. Uh, and you need to have them trained to, to figure out how to work, work the patient up um, in an intelligent format. And so uh, I think you got to start with the effector arm, you know, and figure out what that's going to look like and then develop the best model you can. No model is going to be perfect. And so once you develop the performance characteristics, you can educate the provider as to what those performance characteristics are like. They can get some appreciation for it. And then they can go off and do the, do hopefully do the right thing for patients when, when they get that alert, but they won't walk away saying like this thing's useless, yeah. right? Cause they'll, they'll understand what it's doing and how it performs. So, and as we, um, you know, use more AI and machine learning um, to develop some of these models, you know, we get into the situations um, of these black boxes where clinicians may not may not ever know exactly how um, these models are working. Um, at some point, you are just trusting the model um, to to be you know 
reasonably accurate or, or, or useful. Um, any guidance to how we should think about how to communicate with clinicians? How do we educate around this, knowing that clinicians like like knowing, right? Yeah, it yeah. Feels it, control over it, that. It, I think explainable AI is um, overblown. Would be my comment, right? I think that folks want to understand this, and and you know nobody's saying you know tell me how the facial recognition on my phone works, right? You know, like people just trust it, right? I think what it comes down to is being explainable AI. I'm less concerned about than people having the performance characteristics and understanding how the, what how, what the model is going to generate, I think is important, right? Uh, people like to know, you know, beta coefficients and those types of things. That's why logistic regression is such a, you know, such a, a sought after commodity, I think, in a lot of things. Um, uh, or, you know, people try to apply similar things like shapely curves or that type of thing to, um, to, other, to other modeling techniques to try to come up with explainable AI. I think that is not entirely helpful. I, I think really educate, my opinion is that we need to be educating providers on understanding the performing characteristics of the models and how to interpret the results much more so than telling them why the model is firing, right? I think that is a long-term, a losing argument, right? Because the model care, the best models likely in many situations are not going to be fully explainable, particularly as we start to implement deep learning and those types of things. Unless you want to go back and teach people linear algebra and mm -hmm. all, you know, and, and under that and, and understand all that stuff. You know, and I jokingly used to say, like, I don't think anyone that doesn't know what an eigenvector is should be doing, you know, AI. I'm not, I don't believe that any longer, right? I think that there's enough black boxes out there and people don't necessarily need to understand, understand the complex math to be able to make use of this technology, even as people that are developing models. They probably need assistance with someone in doing this with someone that does understand that stuff uh, to make sure they aren't doing something stupid. But I think that the you know, AI for the masses is here. And, um, and by letting people experiment with this to some extent and develop models uh, using, these, using these technologies um, and understanding that maybe they don't understand entirely what it's doing, they'll, they'll develop better appreciation. But so long as they understand how the model is going to perform, I think that's the important thing. So to so, uh, interpret it, interpret the performance of the model. And, and um, I'm curious, um, what year in the future do you think education on these topics seeps into that medical school curriculum? Like how far away do you think we are from that? Well, I, I think we're getting closer, right? I mean, I think, you know, uh, so I, I recently had to give a, give a talk on this and you look at the literature and you start to see in, you know, cardiology journals, even as far as 10 years ago, people were explaining receiver operating curves and precision recall and that type of stuff. And so I think the issue is uh, people don't necessarily get exposed to this stuff on a routine basis. And when you look at biostatistics, right, most it's 3% of the US MLE. Um, you know, most people memorize a bunch of stuff and they, then it disappears because they're busy, you know, trying to pass their boards and that type of that type of thing. But like anything, as we start to use these technologies and people come up with education curriculums, this will become part of the vernacular um, that we, you know, and we'll, we'll have intelligent conversations. I think they'll happen in the next 10 years. But I think we need to make a conscious decision when we implement these things to start doing this. And I'm not sure we do that, right? You know, um, but once if I think we're going to be forced to. Yeah. Are, are, are you... Um... I'm just curious, like at Iowa, Iowa, is there a clinical informatics fellowship? I'm seeing those pop up more and more in different um, schools, but so we are we are in the process. Um, we have we have approved funding to start one. We are in the process of submitting our application to the ACGME um, at this point. In fact, uh, it's going over to our GME office today. So we're hoping. If anyone's listening to this and interested, uh, <laughs> you know, send me an email. Um, we'll be hopefully taking taking applications sometimes starting in January or so, uh, if assuming we get approved. Yeah. So very neat. 
Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, Jim, I had one last question for you. Uh, you brought up earlier in the conversation, your interests in the omics, like genomics and proteomics and all that. Um, as advancements in those fields start driving, again, more personalized, better care, um, there's already this huge body of literature that no one person can actually consume and digest and understand and filter. Um, I think you've hinted in the past, we need to undergo kind of like a fundamental change in, in workflow and human interfaces or, or computer interfaces with humans, uh, as well as data processing to really take full advantage of all the, the patient's data. How do you envision the future where uh, this sort of level of data acuity and processing is possible? Yeah, we're, I think, just starting to get to the point where we can routinely start to take advantage of genomic information, right? We now have genomic packages from the major vendors. Um, no longer is the PDF going to be the primary mode of exchanging uh, genomic data. Um, as we begin to understand omics, um, you know, uh, and we do metabolic profiling that is at a level that is very different from what, you know, when, when we talk about metabolic profiling right now, um, we're going to need expansions of, of the EMRs to, um, to metabolize that data and provide, provide the, the data structures for us to operationalize that. And I think genetic data, we're, we're starting to do that. Without becoming a CDS nightmare, clinical decision support yeah. nightmare, which I think it, it, you could very rapidly do, I think we need to be thinking very intelligently about what does this look like, right? You know, where are we going to uh, intervene in the clinician workflow? Where are we going to potentially turn this stuff over to population health to manage and identify, okay, this patient has a genetic propensity for um, colon cancer. Um, so we're going to be ultra aggressive in getting them in for their screening from a population perspective. Is that going to rest with their primary care doc? Um, are we going to somehow in our population health push that information to the provider um, in some other mechanism or directly to the patient? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do the education, right? It's going to be complex is the answer. Uh, what the answer is not is firing off, you know, 15,000 BPAs every time uh, a patient mm -hmm. in somebody's in somebody's clinic, right? Uh, and so, how do we intelligently integrate this data into the clinical decision support in a seamless, or I won't say seamless, but in a relatively low friction uh, pathway for providers, so that they aren't just you know dealing with stuff when it pops up on their screen, and that's going to be really important. And I don't think we figured that out as as a as a I don't think we figured that out yet as a, as a healthcare system, right? You know, when you look at a lot of solutions that are out there right now, it's, oh, gee, you know, we can provide you access and we've got this really great intelligent uh, genomic data base and we'll link it into Epic and we'll fire a bunch of BPAs um, at your providers. That, that is probably not the right, probably not the right answer. In certain cases, it is like pharmacogenomics. I'm about to write a drug and I'm going to really overdose somebody based on what we know about um, uh, some specific wheel they have, that's probably appropriate, mm -hmm. but it's probably not appropriate um, for closing their after visit summary saying, oh, by the way, did you remember this patient needs a colonoscopy, right? Yes. You know, that's, that's probably the wrong time to bring that up. So. Hmm. Yeah, it almost seems like it, it involves a personalization of the workflow as well, but based on what the information is saying. Yeah. That's very and tricky. It's going to be very tricky, and I think the big problem right now is every institution is faced with you should develop this on your own. Yeah. Uh, um, and think about how your workflow, how the workflow is at your institution, and I, I think that these are very complex problems that mm -hmm. we would we would be better off if we had some sort of uh, national collaboration surrounding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could totally see that. All right, uh, Jim, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round, five questions to get to know you better for our audience. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first question we have, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Oh, um, that is a, so fiction or nonfiction? Uh, we, we could do one of each if you prefer, or I mean, we've had fiction, we've had nonfiction, we've had it all. 
Okay. Um, you know, I would, I would tell you that probably my favorite, um, my favorite, uh, uh, well, of late, probably the most recent thing I read, um, was Leon Panetta's, um, uh, kind of, uh, kind of memoir. And that was really interesting. Um, so that was, that was a great kind of, uh, a really interesting book about his time in the, in the Clinton, in the Clinton white house, which is wow. you know, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would, I would list that as kind of my favorite, favorite, um, book right now. Um, you know, in terms of fiction, uh, I, I really enjoyed Tom Clancy's kind of early mm. stuff. It was, it nice. was fun. It was fun to read. Right. Oh, you know, it's totally. not great literature, but it's fun. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, question two, who's a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? Um, I would say Winston Churchill. Oh, nice. I yeah. think, uh, you know, some to, to weed a nation through that level of diversity, just in, in being such in, in speaking so, so forcefully and elegantly in that, in those times would, it would just be really interesting to meet to meet the person and get to know you know what get to know what he was really like right yeah you know yeah that's awesome uh, yeah. uh question three would you rather have super strength super speed or the ability to read people's minds read people's minds nice <laughs> without a doubt <laughs> <laughs> now we we do have a follow-up for that one what if you couldn't turn that power off uh well i i should ask my wife she can read my she reads my mind <laughs> so uh she doesn't seem to be able to turn it off so we can see what it's like yeah <laughs> So, at least now you'll be equivalent in the relationship right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes there we go there we go exactly yes. although you'll be reading her mind which will just be reading your mind and then you'll just be lost in your own thought you yeah. just won't be talking yeah <laughs> yes yes exactly exactly oh, that's good so, yeah. uh question for jim what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane Oh, the entire in the U.S. healthcare system, the entire economic process of of healthcare. I mean, if anyone, I don't know if anyone that's actually in it understands it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but how we got here, I mean, this is this is crazy, right? How we pay for healthcare is just beyond beyond nuts. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's rule upon rule that has been built um, to keep the system. It 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 really feels like a house of cards. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we were yeah. talking to a CMIO yesterday who says, you know, when her patients ask her how much will this cost? And she's like, I, I have no idea. Yeah, right. I have no idea how much this costs. And then when you start to ask inside the organization, how much does this actually cost us? People have no idea, right? I yeah. mean, what business outside of healthcare says we have no idea how much it costs to produce the product that we're selling, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's just absolutely bonkers, right? You know, uh, oh, and how much are, how much are we going to get paid for the product? We don't know. Um, right you know yeah. like what well, who else would operate like this right so true you know? yeah yeah very complex yeah. um last question that we have this is a pandemic lockdown related question what is one hobby or activity you've gotten into since the beginning of the pandemic uh so when the pandemic just as the pandemic was getting rolling i was actually uh starting uh, uh flight lessons oh nice um so i I'm now heavily, and I, um, this was actually related. I was doing some work at, at Oak Ridge National Labs and I knew I was driving back and forth. Um, it was about four hours each way. Uh, this was with the VA. And so I, I almost got killed. And one of my colleagues who was a pilot said, you know, it's only a 45 minute flight, you wow. know, to, to, to Knoxville from Atlanta. I was in Atlanta at the time at, at Emory university in the, the Atlanta VA. And so, um, I was like, well, he's on to something, right? I could <laughs> like, you know, I was leaving, I was leaving at four in the morning, getting there at eight, you know, Jeez. meetings from eight 30 to, you know, four and driving home starting oh, at four 30. And, and, and I was like, wow, I could like get up at like, you know, a reasonable hour, fly up there, be home for dinner. So mm -hmm. that's where it started. Um, and now that I'm in the Midwest here in, in, in the upper Midwest, it's a, it's a great skill to have to, mm -hmm. to get around and, you know, get to meetings, that type of thing. That's so cool. So you, you got your license? Have my license, have okay. my instrument writing. I'm uh, in the process of uh, uh, getting my commercial rating. Wow. So um, 
Yeah. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And Very there's cool. a lot, there's a lot of great parallels um, to medicine, right? You know, lessons that we could learn from aviation. You, you mean like checklists or? Just... Well, uh, above, and beyond, <laughs> above, above and beyond checklists, right? You know, I mean, the focus on safety, right? Mm-hmm. The, I mean, checklists are just a, a part of being safe. Mm-hmm. right and the focus on safety and that and the focus on safety and we talked about provider well-being right so one of the things before you get an airplane as a pilot is you know you've got this thing are you you know i'm are you literally it's the i'm safe kind mm-hmm. of you know it's an acronym um but are you safe to be doing what you're to be to be flying that plane today when's the last time someone you heard a surgeon right or an anesthesiologist get asked you know <coughs> are you safe Mm-hmm. to be doing what you're doing today right um and we talk about provider well-being and all that emotional burnout but just how about did that person get a good night's sleep mm-hmm. and if they didn't get a good night's sleep you shouldn't get behind the you shouldn't get behind the or if you're fatigued there would be the comment you shouldn't get behind uh you shouldn't get in the cockpit mm-hmm. right when's the last time you has you heard a surgeon say you know something i'm fatigued i'm going to cancel my case today it's funny because you know like pilots are forced to clock out after a certain number of hours. That, that doesn't happen in medicine. Well, you're only forced to clock out after a certain number of hours if you're flying in, in under certain parts of what's called right. the FAR. So, mm-hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, if you're a private pilot, you can go ahead and fly as mm-hmm. much as you want. There, wow. there's no regulation. So, um, uh, and depending, you know, on what what part of the FAR you're operating underneath. So, um. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think Mm. that, that uh, you, but you shouldn't be thinking about that. It shouldn't be what the regulations are. It should Mm -hmm. be, are you feeling like you should, you are well-equipped to do the case. And I've never had a surgeon except for someone that was up literally all night Mm -hmm. operating say I'm tired. I've been in the operating room. I've had cases, I've had cases scheduled where I, you know, didn't sleep well the night before I was feeling maybe a little under the weather. Was I, was I bringing my true a game Mm -hmm. to the table that day? No, I was not. Right. Right. And uh, a culture of saying you really should be, um, you should really be only doing things if you're well equipped. But then the question comes up is where's the redundancy in the system, Mm -hmm. right? You know, in airlines, right. They've got pilots literally sitting around waiting because someone says i can't fly today mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. you know no health system has that why because we can't afford it right, right. Yes, been sitting around and sees how just sitting around doing nothing if someone if someone's going to be sick and so um i think there's a lot of lessons from aviation mm-hmm. that go well beyond the checklist that if you were going to re-engineer the healthcare system you could learn a lot from wow yeah oh, that's really cool i love that um, well, awesome. Being mindful of your time, Jim, let's wrap it there. But thanks so much for coming on the show. It's a wrap for this episode of the Digital Patient hosted by Seamless MD. You can follow us on Twitter at Seamless MD. If you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Jim, again, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your time with us today. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody.